Warning, this podcast may contain graphic and triggering content. Please listen at your own risk. Each individual struggle is different and everyone's recovery and healing journey is different. Please reach out to a certified medical professional if you need help. Welcome to episode 40 of Stomp the Stigma, the podcast aimed to fight the stigma surrounding mental health through education, awareness, experiences, stories, resources, and the vulnerable truth. Today is part one of two, another very special episode this week. Joining me to stomp the stigma today is Daniela, the voice behind the often unseen. A little over three years ago, her husband, who was a correctional officer at the time, was held hostage by the inmates at the jail that he worked at. So she is here to share their story, a little bit about how they've battled with his PTSD as well as her trauma surrounding the event, and she's here to offer a spouse's perspective on mental health and PTSD. So in today's episode, we get into the events that unfolded that day and the days following, and how she couldn't relate to other spouses of PTSD sufferers because their story was so different. We get into a little bit about putting herself aside to cater to what he needed following the incident and putting herself last to make sure that her family, her house, and her kids were all okay. She started her blog, The Often Unseen, as her kind of first step towards handling her own trauma and putting herself first. So today is a very special episode. I hope you guys love it. Tune in next week for part two as we get more into both of their stories. I don't even know how I want to start this. I'm just, I'm excited to talk to you because you have a different perspective on mental health in general, I guess. Like I've had a mother on the podcast um, and her kind of, her perspective on her daughter's experience, but I've never had a spouse. So I'm really excited to hear kind of your side of the story. I think that's super important for people to hear as well. So thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, the spouse's stories are often sort of untold. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so many people out there don't know how to care for or support someone that that needs it. So um, Uh thank you for being open to sharing your journey so far. If one person can relate to my story or how we've sort of tackled things as they've come, then that's all I can hope for. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I've i read your blog, so I I wouldn't say I know your story because I don't know very much about it, but I'm familiar with, I guess, the basics of what happened. Um, but for everyone that is listening, your husband is a former corrections officer. Yeah. Um, can you share... I guess, what happened on that day that changed your life forever? Yeah, so um, it was September 14th, uh, 2018. So we just passed the three-year sort of anniversary. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a typical day. He was on a day shift. And um, at the time, I was working for myself, running my own business. And I... It was a Friday afternoon, and uh, I had gotten a message from the superintendent at the jail, and it just said, can you call me? So um, I called him, and he he started the conversation really weird. He was like, where are you? And I was like, oh, I'm at home. And home at the time happened to be um, my in-law's house because we had just sold our house, and we're in the process of um, hunting for a new one. And so I said, I'm, he said, you moved, right? And I said, yeah, we're, he, I said, what's going on? And so now I'm kind of thinking like, John got pepper sprayed in an incident or, you know, maybe like a broken ankle or something. I'm not thinking anything, you know, really bad at this point. Um, and then he said, uh, and then he asked for the address. And so I was like, hey, what's what's happening? And all he said was, there's been an incident and they have John. 
And then it was like an out of body experience. I like collapsed to the floor in like panic, shock, disbelief, like all the things. I was like not I couldn't even hear what he was saying anymore at that point. So he he said an OPP, like a police officer and uh, the chaplain from the jail um, are coming over to sit with you until this is over. So I had to like pull myself together. I was trying to figure out what to do. And so I called my mother-in-law and I said, where are you? In my calmest, not calm voice. And she said, I'm just downtown. And we don't live in a big town. Our, our towns, we can get anywhere in like 10 minutes. Uh, she said, I'm just downtown. I said, I need you to come home now. And she was like, oh, okay. So she came home as the OPP officer and the chaplain pulled up. So then I had to tell her what happened, my father-in-law, and I text my family because I, I couldn't even form words. And I, I just text my mom and my dad and my, sis, my two sisters. And I said, this is what's happening. I can't, I can't, you can't tell any, like, don't say anything to anyone, but this is what's happening. So before I knew it, my dad showed up. <laughs> My mom showed up, my one sister showed up, and uh, they were kind of like, what do you need? And so now it's like 2.30, and I've realized, like, I need someone to take care of my kids. They can't come here. I can't tell them. They're young. Like, at the time, my oldest daughter was in grade three, and my youngest was, like, not even two yet. Yeah. So I said to my dad, I need you to pick them up and, and I don't care what you do with them, but you can't bring them here. Mm-hmm. Just do, do something with them. So that was that. And then we, it was, it was hours of just sort of like sitting there in, in sort of like this limbo, like out of body experience. It was like, I was watching myself sit at the dining room table and wait for my phone to ring. And then I started to get text messages from people. Cause like I said, it's a small town. And, um, so I had one friend text me and he said, I heard that there's a hostage at the jail. I hope John's not working today. And so at that point we hadn't like reached out to like John's, my sister-in-laws who are both teachers because it was, they were still working. And so, uh, I said, where did you hear that? That's all I replied with. I said, where did you hear that? He said, people are talking about it in the staff room where he worked. And I didn't respond. So that's when he knew something that it was that I had basically confirmed through not saying anything that it was, that it was John. Um, so then at that point I said to my mother-in-law, we have to let like my sister-in-laws know they can't hear it through, through a third party. So we contacted them and let them know. So it was about um, four hours Um, and then I finally got the call saying that, um, they had John, he was safe. He was like conscious and walking and, um, that the ambulance was there and they were going to take him to the hospital, get assessed. And so like, it's like the, the best call ever. We raced to the hospital and, uh, and seeing him, like, opening those doors and seeing him was just, like, oh, I couldn't contain my emotions. I, like, hugged him. I hugged the paramedics. I was just, like, so thankful that he was there. And so we were there for a couple more hours. You know, he got x-rays and no major physical injuries, um, bruises, things like that, um, a sore shoulder from the way they had him handcuffed and things like that. But no, no major physical injuries that kept him like we, he got to go home that night. So yeah, it was, um, an awful day. It was the worst day, but yeah, he got to come home that night. Our girls came home later that night and we kind of just made up a story for the time being that, he, I don't remember what we said because really his only visible injury um, was that he had like a black eye. And so we just said, dad got hit with something out in the yard. And our, our oldest was like, okay, can I go play with, you know, like she was sort of buying what we were selling. And uh, 
and yeah, and then everything really sort of set in the next day. Like it was like, wow, this happened and nothing will ever be the same again. Wow. Does he yeah. doesn't still work there, does he? Uh, no, he um, did try to go back in a uh, different capacity and more of like an administrative role oh, wow. um, about a year and a half after. And it was, it was going all right. Um, mm. But then they had to start bringing some of the inmates back for different court dates. And so he had kind of said, well, while they're here, I won't come to work and and they were great they were very supportive of of everything and but the longer he was away he kind of realized like I don't want to go back it was really hard for him to separate um himself from that former role and knowing that like all his colleagues and his friends who were still doing this role um and you know when he would hear code go off or the alarms or whatever you know he wasn't going to go with them and that was sort of hard for him to to separate he didn't like that Mm -hmm. um so selfishly I was very happy when he was you know I knew he had to figure that out on his own and and he had said that if he was not going to go back that he wanted it to be on on his terms and not you know because of what happened that day so Mm -hmm. I supported him as best I could and it was hard for me because even during, you know, um, the incident, like as a spouse, you don't know, you don't know what the jail looks like. You don't know, you know, you only know what you see on TV or in movies. And so when you think, you know, hostage taking in the jail, you know, you're kind of thinking the worst of the worst. And so when he wanted to go back, they were actually really good. And they let me go in and do a tour, not necess- not really of the jail, but of where he would be working, like where his office was and sort of that offered me a bit of comfort knowing sort of how separated he was mm-hmm. from that previous sort of life. Um, but yeah, so now, uh, no, he He's not working there anymore. He no longer works for the ministry. And the, um, I guess, positive spin on this, if you will, is that um, he's been able to sort of figure out what he's really passionate about and um, what he really loves. And that is fitness and helping people. And and prior to this, he had been... Um, working to become a coach at our local CrossFit gym here. And uh, he was able to sort of continue on that journey. And now that's what he's doing um, full time. So I'll never really call that day a blessing. But if there was a positive part of the outcome of all this, it's that, you know, he's, he's found what he really wants to do. I mean, I don't think many people, you know, ever really think I really want to be a corrections officer because it's, it's probably the most thankless of first responder jobs because no one sees them. They're not out in the community. No one can see the good they're doing. The people they're helping are, you know, awful criminals and they don't, you know, they're just hidden behind those cement walls. So, you know, it doesn't come with the the prestige of, you know, being a firefighter or yeah. things like that. So Oh, I love that he's found what he's really passionate about. That's oh, that's the best. Yeah. It, and it was kind of, you know, like I've earned this right to, you know, you've gone through this awful thing and you, it's kind of like you could sit around or or take another job within the ministry because they'll give you reassignments and things like that because it's a huge um, ministry to work for but really at the end of the day if you're going to a job that you aren't loving he was he was past that now Mm -hmm. he was like no that's not worth it anymore yeah 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 okay so now he struggles with ptsd even still today, right? Yeah, I would say it's pretty managed at this point. Um, it's more little things here and there, but really, I think between having his routines and doing 
something he loves has really helped him forward. Mm -hmm. Um, It was pretty rough in the beginning, probably like the first year or so. Um, But we were really lucky in that he, he recognized right away, like pretty much the next day that he wasn't okay and that he needed to start talking to someone. And so he did. Um, the jail had brought in, you know, obviously a crisis team right away and counselors and things like that for all the staff there. And he was able to access some of that. And then we were given the name of a psychologist um, in Winnipeg who primarily deals with a first responders. So um, had a lot of experience with PTSD and sort of that line of work. And he started t- seeing someone almost right away and um at first it was every week and then every other week and now it's sort of you know as he feels he needs it um and he was able to help John work through a lot of of things and you know take different steps and so in that was kind of what left me feeling sort of isolated and alone because when I would look for resources or online communities for spouses, Mm -hmm. it was a lot of military stuff because of course PTSD rates are so high among (laughs) military um, personnel. Um, But also a lot of the stories that these spouses had were really dark, you know, that you know, their spouses had turned to, you know, self, self-medicating self or, you know, really dark depression and really disassociated. And that wasn't my experience, thankfully, because John was able to reach out for help so quickly. But there were still lots of ups and downs. It just wasn't that he was, you know, hiding in the basement drinking all day. He mm-hmm. was still being a father to our kids and, and doing what he could and going to the gym. The gym was his sort of sanctuary. Um, and I would often say to him, if he was in a mood or I could tell that he was not in a good place, I'd be like, you should go to the gym. Have you been to the gym today? Like that was, and he would always come back like feeling better. He needed that time away for himself to sort of focus on anything but, you know, life and just focus in on, you know, whatever he was going to do for that hour. But yeah, I, I was never able to find anything that was like, yes, my spouse struggles with PTSD. Like, yes, we're navigating this, but it's not the, the worst of the worst sort of scenarios. Right. And so that's when I sort of started thinking about there must be other, you know, spouses, primarily women out there struggling to, you know, hold, hold their family and their houses, you know, together to be the, to be the glue to, you know, be the protector and and all these things that you sort of take on as someone living with a spouse with PTSD, you know, you, you, micromanage everything to try and make sure that everything's always going as smooth as possible. You protect them from, you know, outsiders or intruders or, you know, just people being nosy or even family members, you know, who, you know, are, how are things going? You're just like, things are great. Yeah, we're doing good. You never want to like let people know how bad it it is because you don't want them to think less of your of your spouse. Mm-hmm. So you take on all these things and you, but you, you can feel really alone in it if you haven't found sort of a community to, to immerse yourself in. And so that's what I had a hard time finding. You know, I, I wasn't a military spouse, so I couldn't relate to, you know, the constant moving and things like that and how isolating that can be. And, you know, my husband's, you know, PTSD wasn't, violent or or you know self-medicate you know he wasn't becoming an alcoholic he wasn't turning to drugs he was 
was not removing himself from our family, but it was still hard. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it was, it was difficult to sort of find my place in this PTSD mental health world, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what was the, the hardest part about understanding kind of what he needed from you or, or that you couldn't fix, uh, you couldn't fix it. It was hard to let go of that. My, that my husband, that I knew that I had been married to for nine years was not ever going to be the same husband. That guy that I knew that I married, he was gone. And it took a while for me to, to sort of accept that because it's hard and it's not that he's gone and now it's awful, but it's like, he's changed. He's different. All these things that you get to know about someone over, you know, 11 years of being together. And now it's like, Hey, I got it. You got to do that all over again. Cause a lot of, you know, little quirks or personality traits, things have changed. Um, their capacity for things are different. And so just learning all those things like, oh, your capacity for like noise or how chaotic, you know, having kids can be like, that is lower, you know, the capacity for like being in large crowds or, you know, around unknown people or things like that, like that is different. And, And also just, especially in the beginning, being like, whatever it is you need is what we'll do, you know? Mm -hmm. So the first year, um, this happened, you know, it happened in September. So that first Christmas, you know, there was a night where we were going to his parents for dinner, the same childhood house he grew up in, the same house we had just moved out of. Um, only his, you know, brothers, it's just like only our family was going to be there. But he was like, I can't go. I'm just, I, he, he couldn't go. He was anxious and he was unsettled. And normally, you know, I would have been like, are you kidding me? It's Christmas. Like as if you're skipping Christmas dinner, but that's what he needed. I wasn't going to force him to go somewhere where it was, you know, he was in, in a place feeling unsafe, even though rationally it was a safe place for him in that moment. He, he wasn't feeling that. And And I just had to say, okay, you just do what's needed in that moment. A lot of it, especially in the beginning, was what do you need right now? You know, okay, you need quiet. You need to be alone. You need to go to the gym. You need to, like, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a lot of what do you need right now? What can I do for you right now? Because really, you're just managing it as it comes, as it comes. And that is also really hard because I'm like, a fixer like I can tell something's wrong what can I do I want to fix it you know for you right now Mm -hmm. and a lot of the times it's like I don't know what I need or I don't you know or I can't I don't have the skills or the ability to fix it so it's like hey well what can I do in this moment like I said you're you're it's kind of like you're getting to know someone you've known forever (laughs) all over again yeah Yeah, I do want to focus on kind of the caregiver side of things, because I think that's super important and and definitely not talked about enough. And people often forget or don't realize that caregivers and supporters of those who are struggling with mental health also experience the pain. Like there's a stigma that just because you're not the one going through it, that you're fine. Right? But But that's not the case at all. And Like you experience, I guess, secondhand trauma when you're kind of hearing about events and things like that. But then you also have your own trauma. Like you have your own trauma from like getting that call and waiting for what's happening and all of these other events that happen to just you. You also have your own trauma, which it's obviously different from what he went through, but it's still trauma to you. Right. So. Oh, yeah. It's. um... And, and like three years later, and I am just starting to 
work through that because I mean, in, in those first two years, really, it was all, all my energy, all my focus was on, on him and, and helping him heal yeah. and keeping my kid's life normal and keeping our house, you know, afloat and doing all, you know, the normal things that, you know, spouses, especially moms do, you know, packing lunches and, you know, making sure things are organized and doing all those things that, you know, are just done, you know, like signing up for swimming lessons or, you know, organizing birthday parties or planning sleep. Like you're doing all these things that you would normally be doing, but now on top of that, you're, you're, you know, managing all this unknown. And so you, but for me anyways, I put myself like last. It was like John, my kids, mm-hmm. the how like pretty much you know, everybody else and then me. And yeah, there's sort of this stigma or things that we like to say to to, you know, spouses or, or anyone like, oh, you're gotta be strong for them or yeah, they really need you know, all those yeah. things. And you're like, yeah, I am being strong for him. Yeah, I am, you know, being there to support him and and do all the things he needs. And, but in that, it's like, <sighs> I also need, I also need those things. And no, I can't be strong 24-7 yeah. because I am basically all you're doing is just burying all these feelings and blocking them out or, and they'll sneak out and you'll have this little moment. And then you're like, no, I'm not dealing with that yet. Mm -hmm. And it's exhausting and it's isolating and it's not something I would recommend, but it can be hard when you're caregiving for everyone else to even think, think of like what do I need to take care of myself because you're also exhausted it's exhausting being a a caregiver and so it from for me it wasn't really until starting the blog uh, so that was like a year ago now that was sort of my first step into my healing journey I wasn't ready to like start going to therapy or talking to someone because I knew I I just wasn't there yet I didn't have the capacity to take that on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um I knew it was something I would need to do eventually and um but I wasn't there yet so writing and starting the blog um was sort of that first step and even in that when the story is not solely your own when it's shared trauma it's it's um a little nerve-wracking and so I had said to my husband I'm thinking of doing this this is why and I had written a few of my first pieces before I I published the website I said I want you to read them and tell me if this is okay like because it's my story, but like, Mm -hmm. you're the big part of it here. So, and he was really great and really supportive and was like, yeah, this is, you know, your story. And really everything that I'm saying was, is already out there in some other form because he had done a couple podcast interviews um, at that point. And so that was my first step into it was just sort of like getting my words and my feelings and working through them on my own that way. And only like this past summer did I start talking to someone professionally and yeah one of the things that like we've been working on is acknowledging that like yeah this incident happened to to John you know but yeah there's a whole nother there's a whole other side to it and it's it's that while he was there going through what he was going through I was sitting at the dining room table going through something yeah completely different but also valid and it's 
it's still hard to sort of acknowledge or accept because I think you're, yeah, there's this stigma of like, oh my God, is she doing this for attention or, oh, and I've never run into that, but like, it's sort of like you've internalized it. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want people to think I'm doing this for attention or that like, God, I should be over this by now or, you know, whatever. But yeah, really realizing that like, you can't compare. I think that's a big message that needs to just be shouted more, especially in the mental health PTS, especially the PTSD world is that like, you can't compare, you know, um, some people can be police officers for, you know, 35 years and, and not, you know, seemingly have PTSD. Mm -hmm. Um, and then other people, you know, could do it for five years and, and have severe P like everybody's different. Everybody capacity is different and you get nowhere by comparing. Yeah. Like it just, it doesn't change anything. It just brings more shame. And so for the spouses out there, you know, that was sort of, you know, the name that I picked for my blog, the often unseen was like a twofold, like one, because corrections officers are, you know, you never, really seen in the first responder world a lot and then as a spouse you're seen even less Mm -hmm. like you're like what a spouse you have a story like (laughs) oh what could your story possibly be (laughs) so yeah it's just there's comparing gets you nowhere um it just causes people to like hide in shame which never probably means you're never healing you talk a lot about or in your blog about like hiding your own trauma and keeping everything inside so you don't add to like your husband's struggles or your family's struggles yeah like your when your husband has been through this incredibly traumatizing event but so have you right like uh-huh. was there kind of a turning point for you when you realized that you needed to start taking care of yourself too? Uh, I think I, I think I knew it for a while. Yeah, probably a while in the beginning. It's just, you're so hyper-focused on, on them yeah, that it doesn't cross your mind, but probably maybe after year two, it was like, okay, he seems to be doing good. It was almost like I needed to know that he was going to be okay. Once I felt like as a whole, our family unit was like secure and safe and taken care of, that was like this permission to myself that I needed that, okay, they will all be okay if I take a little tiny bit of my focus that I put on everyone else and turn it to myself because yeah, in the beginning, like you just, there's no possible ounce of focus that you feel like you have left because I think I talked in one of my blogs about how like every, like I started to micromanage Mm -hmm. everything because you're trying to make sure that like there is never an unknown there is like yeah. nothing's ever going to be a surprise everything's going to go as planned and that, that in itself is exhausting um, mentally and so there was no room for like oh yeah take time for yourself and oh yeah you should probably work through this yeah. like shit that you're carrying around heavily um so yeah once you know things started to fall into place you know with him for work and what he wanted to do and our kids were healthy and and thriving and you know having a normal you know childhood I was like okay I should probably do this um and then this past spring was a gong show for our family (laughs) Um, And it just kind of put things off. So we finally had the um, 
court dates happen in relation to this. So that was a long time coming, which also kind of put a bit of a uh, break on the healing journey because yeah. you have no idea what this is going to be like. Again, when you think like court, all you know is TV or whatever. You're like, you know, like law and order, like what's going to happen here? Like, but what we learned is the justice system is slow. There's lots of these red tape processes, um, but everything worked out um, in our favor and, and, pretty much as best as we could have hoped for. But so that happened um, in April. And just before we were getting ready to prepare to go, because we it wasn't here in our town. It was um, six hours away in the next biggest Ontario city in Thunder Bay. Um, about a week before we were getting ready to go for that, we got a call from... Ottawa because our oldest daughter had severe um, scoliosis and needed spinal surgery. So basically we got back from Thunder Bay on a Friday and we left for Ottawa with our oldest on the Sunday. So uh, all in all, we ended up being away from our youngest for three weeks. <laughs> it was awful. Um, it was during COVID, you know, we were basically in our room at Ronald McDonald House and the hospital and back and forth. And so, again, just, you know, you you put yourself last when everything else is, is happening around you. So um, the court stuff got taken care of. That was all done. It went well. It was a good piece of closure for my husband and for myself. Like, he got to see some of the people involved for the first time and to um, sort of say something to them in, um, in something he had prepared. Um, so that gave him a lot of closure and just because how it works is basically they, they entered a, a, a guilty plea, they pled guilty. Um, but so when that happens, they read like the statement of facts. So it kind of felt like I was listening to like a movie screenplay be read um, because it was like on September 14th, 2018 at 1 4 PM officer centaur. Like it was a play by play of everything that went down because then they'll go, do you agree to these? Like, this is what you're saying you're guilty of. Like, does this sound right? Which was really hard to listen to, but it also gave me a lot of closure because well, I knew a lot of what had happened, like, hearing it like that and basically being able to piece it together in my mind put a lot of like unknowns to rest for me mm -hmm. and um so that that was good in a way for me so anyways once we made it through that spring of all this craziness and again it was like things were going well for my husband at work and and things were thriving and and our daughter was healthy and everything was sort of, you know, taken care of. Then it was like, okay, I feel like I could now afford myself some focus. Um, but it was like, I was waiting for that to feel like everyone else around me was stable before I felt unstable, mm -hmm. not unstable, but to allow myself the space and the capacity to work through whatever might come up. So it's been a long, a long time coming. Thankfully I've had you know, lots of support from family and friends who I've been able to talk to and work through, you know, things along the way, but um, only recently have I started sort of unpacking that deep shit that I've just buried for yeah. three years thanks for tuning in today you guys i hope you loved this episode as much as i did i know i say that every week but this episode was extra special tune in again next week for part two of my conversation with daniela as we dive even further into her story and her family's battle with ptsd
Thank you so much for tuning in today. Feel free to reach out at any time. You can contact me on Instagram and Facebook at Stomp the Stigma YYC, and you can email me at Stomp the Stigma YYC at gmail.com. If you like the podcast, please like and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. And if you or someone you know would like to come on, I would love to have you share your story, speak your truth, and together we can stomp the stigma.